welcome back to the war room where we're going to take an in-depth look at a british trench raid in february 1917. we had a very macro view in the last video talking about the developments in offensive and defensive tactics going into 1917 so here we're going to get back to the micro we're also going back to 4th Battalion Duke of Wellington's regiment, the same unit that we followed through a battalion attack on the Somme. 4 DWR took very heavy casualties on the 3rd of September 1916, losing 347 men out of a total of 647. By the 15th, it had been reconstituted. The officers and NCOs of C Company, which hadn't taken part in the attack, had been spread out to form the skeleton of new A, B and D companies with new drafts and officers being brought in to bring the battalion back up to full strength. On the 1st of February 1917, they enter the line at Riviere, south of Arras, and soon receive orders to secure an identification by conducting a raid on the enemy lines. Identifications were a key component of the constant intelligence process by taking prisoners or otherwise acquiring insignia, identity discs, papers and the like, both sides sought to find out exactly which enemy units were manning what parts of the front, which could be fed into the greater intelligence picture. So, at 2145 on February the 17th, a special raiding party of 76 officers and men under Captain Mowat, previously of C Company, waits in no man's land for zero hour, 10 o'clock. 5 DWR has now rotated into 4th Battalion's stretch of the line, and they've sent fighter patrols out earlier in the night to make sure there are no Germans operating in between the trenches. A six-man party from D Company, 4 DWR, goes out an hour before zero hour to cut and mark a path through the outer layers of the German wire. The raiding party itself exits the trenches via a Russian sap, basically a trench with a roof, and has assembled in no man's land. A German searchlight sweeps the area, but the Dukes aren't spotted. At 2200, zero hour, the supporting barrage begins. Pre-registered guns start firing shrapnel along the Germans' frontline trench. As it begins, 2nd Lieutenant Hurst, with two men and three sappers from 57 Field Company Royal Engineers, start following the pre-marked path forward to the main belt of wire up ahead. Between them, they carry a 22-foot-long Bangalore torpedo. This is a tube filled with explosives. The idea is to push the tube through a barbed wire entanglement, then blow it up to make a path. Originally, the raiding party had two, but one was apparently left behind after being found unusable. Along with the barrage, other supporting fires come online. X-14 medium trench mortar battery, 147 brigade light trench mortar battery, 147 and 148 machine gun companies, plus Lewis guns in the frontline trenches, all contribute to the fire plan. As the target area is pasted with shrapnel, a faint barrage is dropped further along the line to confuse the enemy as to the exact location of the raid. The machine guns sweep the front line, fire down enemy communications trenches, and engage the area around Fishu Mill. After four minutes, the artillery opens up from a line to a box barrage to isolate the target area and give the raiders space to work in. The Germans fire flares, which inadvertently give the torpedo party some light to work with. They need it because the wire is very thick and the Bangalore torpedo is very heavy. Once it's jammed in, most of the party retreats. Second Lieutenant Hurst and one of the sappers light the fuse and then leg it. The torpedo detonates, blasting a hole in the wire, and the raiders surge forward in column of sub-elements. On reaching the gap, they find that the torpedo hasn't cut a hole all the way through. Knowing they can't afford to get caught on the wire, there doesn't appear to be any German reaction just yet, but that's not going to last, the front runners, including Captain Mowat and Sergeant Moskrop, throw themselves the barbed wire with billhooks. A billhook is a hedging instrument somewhere between a sickle and a knife. It's used for hooking and cutting branches, as well as being a solid instrument for dealing with barbed wire. I'm sure trench raiders found other uses for them. Hacking at the wire and, to quote the history, hurling great chevaux de friezes to one side, they break through. Sergeant Moskrop is the first to enter the trench, leading the 12 men of the left flank party. Their job is to punch up the trench to the left, clear it out and establish a blocking position as close to the box barrage as they can. 
Behind Moskrop's men comes the right flank party of another 12 men under 2nd Lieutenant Purvis, whose job it is to do the same thing on the right. Moskrop immediately comes on a German sentry post with three men in it. Two of these are bayoneted, and the third man is taken prisoner. Moskrop sends him back to where the parapet party is set up at the entry point. There are 14 men in the parapet party, plus Captain Mowat. Two signalers who have run a telephone wire out behind the raiders so that the captain can communicate with the battalion. Two runners for when the telephone wire is broken. Two buglers for more local audio signalling. Two stretcher bearers to evacuate casualties and six more soldiers to help out with the party's other tasks of providing security, widening the gap in the wire from an easy withdrawal and controlling prisoners. Sergeant Moskrop continues pushing left and encounters more Germans in the trench. These successfully block the British from getting further, but half of the flanking parties are making their way along the parapet in parallel. These drop into the trench behind the Germans and attack them from behind, killing all except one. The last man is taken prisoner, but something evidently goes wrong somewhere. The history says the prisoner, after his capture, fired at and wounded Moskrop, so he was promptly killed. I think there are some question marks over exactly what might have happened there, but regardless, the left flank party presses on until they bump into another group of Germans who keep them at bay with hand grenades. On the right, 2nd Lieutenant Purvis's right flank party also encounters resistance. Sergeant Sheard, in the lead, shoots the first three Germans they come across, but they run into more enemy on the Parados, throwing grenades at them. The sergeant is wounded, along with four other men. Despite this, they're able to hold their position and keep the Germans away from the rest of the raiders. Both flank parties have bypassed all the enemy dugouts as per the plan, leaving them to the dugout clearing party, which is split into left and right elements under 2nd Lieutenant Butler and Sergeant Johnson. These soldiers follow the flank parties, stopping to throw grenades and 3-inch stoke mortar bombs down all the dugout entrances they can find. At least some of these are definitely occupied. Shots are fired from one dugout entrance, and voices speaking German are heard from another, leading to both being bombed. The final element of the raiding force is the communication trench party, consisting of 12 men under 2nd Lieutenant Blakey. Similar to the left and right parties, their job is to push as far as they can up the enemy communications trench in the centre of the raiding area and block it, again protecting the dugout clearing party while it works. As it happens, they can't find the communication trench they're looking for. The history suggests that the raid is slightly off target and the wire was blasted in the wrong place, meaning that the communications trench is simply elsewhere. After trying and failing to find it, Blakey's men help out with the dugouts. The entire raiding party had entered the enemy trenches by 2206, or six minutes after zero hour. By 2218, Mowat judges from his position on the parapet that they've done enough. They've secured a prisoner for identification and blown up all the dugouts they can find. So he orders the recall. The two buglers he has with him in the parapet party sound the signal and the men pass the word along. The communications trench and dugout parties leave first, exiting the German trench aided by some light ladders the raiders brought with them for that express purpose. The flank parties collapse back to the entry point, covered by their sub-elements up on the parapet, and then withdraw as well. By 2229, the raiding party has recrossed no man's land and re-entered the British trenches, with all its wounded and no missing. The all clear is given, and the artillery barrage shifts back onto the German front line. Overall, the raiders suffered seven wounded, with Sergeant Scheer dying of his wounds a few days later. German casualties are naturally harder to pin down using only British sources, but along with the prisoner, the raiders claim to have seen at least 17 German dead. It's also difficult to imagine anyone caught inside a dugout when hand grenades or three-inch mortar bombs went off inside would escape injury. So this is a very successful raid. To quote 4DWR's commander, Lieutenant Colonel Ari Sugden, the raid secured identification and undoubtedly inflicted heavy casualties at small expense. The history likewise describes it as an unqualified success. One important element in that success appears to be the German defence. 
In stark contrast to 4DWR's action at the Somme, there is no mention of a counter barrage or small arms fire from other defensive positions, whether on the flanks or in depth. The raiding party's casualties were all taken in the enemy trenches, almost entirely to hand grenades, despite all 76 men crossing no man's land twice and several sub-elements operating up on the parapet outside the trenches. Certainly, the German unit in the line here appears to have been quite passive. The raid is actually the Duke's last resort to securing an identification because, to quote the history again, enemy patrols were conspicuous by their absence. In other words, there were no Germans out in no man's land at night that they could ambush. This combined with the speed of the raid, all over in 30 minutes, the darkness and the deception efforts of the fire plan almost certainly made it hard for the enemy to pin down exactly what was happening and react appropriately. The apparent absence of artillery fire from the defence is a bit of an eyebrow raiser, but it's important to remember that the kind of all-destroying artillery barrage that isolated and destroyed 4DWR at the Somme is a feature of the kind of significant concentrations of batteries that come with major battles. This was not a major battle, and the Germans certainly did not have the same kind of industrial capacity of the Allies to swamp the entire front line with artillery. So it could simply have been that the German defensive artillery fire was too thin and serving too many targets along the front, thanks to the British deceptions, to really have an impact. Regardless, the point here is that 4DWR's raiders probably had a lot of luck, and a somewhat obliging enemy. There are plenty of trench raids out there that end in disaster. That doesn't mean there's nothing to learn from this raid though. This is a prime example of a well choreographed set piece going right. Everything has been planned down to the last detail, and the raiding party has been split into task organised sub elements. Every problem or potential problem has a team assigned to it. The Bangalore Torpedo Party is there to blast through the wire. The flanking parties and the communication trench party are there to push out and secure the immediate area for the duration of the raid. The dugout party is there to blow up enemy dugouts. The parapet party is there to secure the line of retreat and maintain communications. There's also a degree of redundancy built in, so when the Bangalore torpedo doesn't completely clear the wire, the party has bill hooks to help finish the job. When the communication trench party can't find their objective, they switch to aiding the dugout party. Another important aspect is that one of these elements is commanded by a non-commissioned officer, Sergeant Mosgrub, and all of the other parties are further subdivided into smaller teams, like the trench and parapet elements of the flanking parties, half of which were commanded by NCOs. So inside the framework of the plan, we're seeing responsibility and tactical decision making reaching further down the ranks. It's definitely not all on the officers at this point. Other elements are also well planned. We don't only have infantry artillery coordination baked into the plan, we also have sappers with the Bangalore Torpedo Party. So as well as coordinating with external elements for certain tasks like the fire plan, the raiders have also directly incorporated external specialists for the duration of the raid. It's also been specifically planned to be a short action, so that all the simultaneous scripts have less time to diverge from each other and break down. While there is certainly the potential for things to go wrong and plans to derail in a 30 minute raid, the longer it gets, the likelihood of reality throwing the planning out increases dramatically. Finally, this is a low level operation. At the Somme, 4DWR was part of a brigade attack that was itself a component of a divisional army and army corps level battle. The raid, on the other hand, is planned out at least at battalion level, if not right down at the level of the company sized raiding party itself. So there aren't higher commanders and staff officers working everything out, it's down to 4DWR themselves. Similar to the spread of tactical responsibility and decision making down from senior officers to junior officers to NCOs, we're also seeing the spread of tactical responsibility and decision making down from brigade to battalion to company in some circumstances. One conspicuous element missing from this raid though is the German defence in depth we looked at in the last video. 
We are only in February 1917 here though, and that new system has yet to be thoroughly put into practice. The German army is still really codifying its change of doctrine at this stage, and it's not until later in the year that elastic defense in depth really sees its first applications. However, using 4DWR's rays, we can start to see how the choreographed set piece and defense in depth are going to interact. The raid has been tightly scripted to not go beyond what it needs to do. The Dukes need to cross no man's land, enter the German trenches, secure an identification, do some damage, and then return. It is purposefully limited in scope. Yes, this is partially because a trench raid is naturally more limited than a full-on attempt to take and hold ground, but it is also because there's an acknowledgement that beyond a point, the scripts break down, causing difficulties and casualties to increase, while results diminish. Defense in depth, however, relies on the attacker penetrating deep into the defensive system. After expending significant effort breaking in, the attacker will be fragmented, under strength, and ripe for destruction in detail by counterattacks from depth. But one of the key reasons the attackers become fragmented and under strength is because they have pushed past the limits of their scripted planning and coordination, which we can see the British specifically trying to avoid. So we have a bit of a mismatch here. A defensive system that relies on an attacker penetrating to a depth of several kilometers is not going to do very well against an offensive system that attacks to a depth of a few hundred meters or less. This does not mean that the attacker has an easy time. 4DWR were incredibly lucky in their raid on the 17th, and although the British are able to conduct similarly successful limited set-piece bite-and-hold attacks going into 1917, in particular the Canadians at Vimy Ridge, these are not painless operations. And more importantly, they are not war-winning operations. Although the British and French can pretty reliably claw small chunks of land back from the Germans in 1917, that's not enough. Even stringing repeated bite and hold attacks together on the same area of front results in a culminating point beyond which results significantly diminish. The British tried this at 3rd Ypres, or Passchendaele, and although initially successful in the second phase of the battle from September, the sheer volume of artillery needed to pulverize and suppress the defenders, chews up the ground, destroys what's left of the drainage system in an area with a high water table, and does more than anything to reduce progress to a crawl. Passchendaele is infamous in the UK but somewhat reflective of the entire war. One of the reasons the British command persists at Passchendaele despite the horrendous conditions is because they know it's just as bad, if not worse, for the German defenders. Because all the men, war material and ammunition, especially artillery ammunition, that the British and French expended on the Western Front could be replaced from the resources of their world-spanning empires and the pending introduction of the immense, if nascent, military muscle of the United States. By the end of 1917, the Germans, with considerably more limited resources to draw on, know they can't keep up with this. They can't carry on fighting defensively, getting chewed away, hoping the Entente powers will give up because it's just too painful. They need to go on the offensive themselves, and strike a blow that will either break the Entente or force them to the negotiating table. With the collapse of Tsarist Russia in the east, freeing up enough German troops to allow them to resume the offensive in the west, they're set for one last roll of the dice before the Americans arrive in overwhelming numbers in 1918. And we'll take a look at that next time. Thanks for watching, hope you all enjoyed this one, and I'll catch you in the next video.